activist and journalist and was expelled by the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn on trumped up charges of anti-Semitism. They didn't, in the end, expel him on those words, but that is what he was disciplined for. Uh, on my right, uh, equally, a veteran journalist and campaigner, Lee Jasper, a man who served at the highest level in the mayoralty of London under our old friend Ken Livingstone. And on my far right, if he'll excuse uh, the designation, Kunle Olulodi, a black film historian and director of Voice for Change. Kunle, let me start uh, with you, if I may. Um, it wouldn't have come as any surprise to you what happened in Minneapolis. Why do you think it sent such shockwaves across America? I think for a, a different generation, the impact of those images is quite startling. And I think the additional um, technological advances that are at people's disposal, those images from the moment that incident happens can be beamed around the world, landing on people's mobile phones. And if you're a young person in London, who probably knows a little bit about America, probably knows that there might be some tension in race relations, but seeing it graphically is a whole different ballgame. And there is no human being, I think black or white, who could not connect with what was being seen there. And people did. And I think that, you know, the worst thing that could have happened, I mean, had that incident happened, is that people actually did know. You know, I can make many criticisms about young people today. People describe them as snowflakes. But that single moment, I think, was a, a, a catalyst for people actually really understanding something that had probably had not, had not been crystallized clearly in their mind. That's why I came to you first, because it seems to me the filming of it is the X factor. Uh, nobody filmed Medgar Evers being murdered. Uh, nobody filmed little Emmett Till being butchered and lynched. Uh, we had to wait for Bob Dylan to write a song uh, about it, or virtually nobody outside of his immediate circle, or the immediate circles in the United States would ever have heard. But George Floyd uh, is now everywhere precisely because it was filmed. So when they said the revolution will not be televised, they were wrong, weren't they? It's the televising that might make the revolution. Well, I'm a big fan of Gil Scott Heron, so I'm not going to take him up I'm on that. I'm a fan of his father because he played for Celtic. I know that, I know that. Um, I, I think the question is that visual media is now open to everyone. Um, anybody can make a film. Anybody can actually relay information visually. And that is a challenge to police forces across America because basically people are now watching you. They've got eyes on you everywhere. So Lee, Lee, Lee Jasper in uh, 1968 at the infamous Democratic Party convention, uh, the slogan was, the whole world is watching uh, as the cops laid into mainly white uh, demonstrators outside the convention protesting the Vietnam War. The whole world really is watching now. Absolutely, and I think that, that viral interconnectivity has uh, made visual. Uh, and I also think the trauma of the, the video, I had great difficulty watching it from the beginning to the end. I kept turning away because it was so traumatic a piece that I think the trauma of seeing somebody pleading begging for their lives, 8 minutes 46 seconds, with the, with the audience of the public pleading with the officers to provide them some assistance, and the extent to which the callous and inhumane response of the officers was to stand to attention and stand proud in watching this black man expire underneath the knee uh, of that uh, officer shoulder. I think it, it was so resonant of the international uh, black experience in relation to racism not just of uh, Africans in America, but actually Africans in Brazil, uh, Aboriginal communities in Australia. Uh, and uh, I think that that visual nature of the trauma, uh, and as Conley says, the ability to spread that in such a quick, real-time way has given rise to 
an unprecedented response that we've seen throughout the world. Just for the avoidance of doubt, because I've seen some foolish criticism, uh, why, why did she film the hall? Why didn't she uh, run to his aid? Why didn't the public around uh, run to his rescue? The answer is because the police would have shot them. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. There's no uh, underestimating the extent of the, uh, 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 the deadly nature of American uh, police services. They will shoot on sight. And we've seen uh, uh, with the young guy uh, jogging in the middle of uh, uh, Austin, Texas, uh, just how quickly uh, not just the police, but white people in general will pull a gun and shoot a black person dead and not think about it for one uh, iota of a second. So she was right to film it. She was right also not to get involved. Mark Wordsworth, those were very powerful words uh, just spoken there. Uh, the universal black experience. Speak to that if you will, because if this was just an issue in Minneapolis, was just an issue even in the United States. We probably wouldn't be talking about it here today. Well, we might, but the audience wouldn't have been as big. Uh, it's the fact that, as Kunle put it, everyone watching it could connect to it. Absolutely. And 17-year-old Darnella Fraser, who did the film, a black teenager, is a hero of our time. People who have been raising her name in the same breath as talking about Rosa Parks in um, 1955, when I was born. The fact that she had the presence of mind and the bravery to capture that moment, that lynching, is incredible. She held her nerve. Her job was to record this iconic moment for history, for all of us, and to, as a result of it appearing that uh, eight minutes and 46 seconds of vicious, ruthless police brutality against an unarmed black man with a knee on his neck, lying helplessly on the ground, sent, sent shockwaves of revulsion around the world that not only mobilized black youth from, you know, every place you can think of in the United States, in, um, uh, in Europe, uh, this has galvanized a generation that themselves have suffered police brutality through stop and search. Four times more likely to be stopped by the police in uh, Britain than a white person. You know, my own sons, I have sons that have been brutalized in that way. Um, you know, they start off in a, with a neutral view about what they describe as the feds and end up hating them because they're stopped and routinely humiliated. Let's go to America. Jonathan Jacob Moore in Oakland, California, uh, is a podcast host and activist, describes himself as an anti-imperialist. Uh, Jonathan, yes. what is your take on events witnessed in America following the killing of George Floyd? I think that what we're seeing across the U.S. and around the world um, in solidarity is a real-time reckoning with how fundamental anti-blackness and anti-black violence is to the holistic fun functioning, excuse me, of our societies. From Bristol to Detroit to Los Angeles to uh, Puerto Rico, we are witnessing a movement of people, uh, especially young people, who are coming to terms with how police violence against black people, economic deprivation, uh, political disenfranchisement, these are all tethered uh, together by a logic. And I believe that it is the normalization and the adherence to this logic of anti-blackness, of violence, that um, we're witnessing people in the streets educating and organizing against. I think, you know, we'd certainly be remiss to, you know, not mention how the uh, COVID crisis has uh, not only further unveiled the kind of inner workings of capitalism for people to see up close and personal. But I think it's also creating a situation where, you know, organizing is more dangerous than normal. And physical protests are more dangerous than normal. And so that the fact that the streets are full of people across the globe should really speak to how righteous rage against this sort of founding logic of anti-blackness is really a potent motivator. You know, um, most Black people 
people in the U.S. are still experiencing really bleak rates of COVID transmission in their communities um, and deaths in our communities. So people are really risking a lot when they're organizing out in the streets. Um, and I think, you know, that speaks to how the, the risks that black people in America face every day are comparable to the risk that we face organizing in a pandemic. You know, it really is a sort of life and death situation for millions of people every day. Is there a difference between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party on issues of race and discrimination? Yeah, that's a, that's a really big and great question, George. I, you know, I, I think I'll say that as a young black person living in America, I believe there are plenty of us who feel that something else entirely is possible. Um, that the two-party system is a sham, that um, both parties are really invested in disguising that antagonism that you know has its roots in uh, African slavery and native genocide. Um, and we're really committed to imagining an entirely different world. I think that you know the fact that that question is even asked really tells us that there, there are no substantial differences between these parties in what they're willing to do to radically transform um, the relationship uh, between black people and violence in the United States and globally. I think that if young people saw from the Democratic Party um, not just you know the same old policy solutions, 